Okay, brilliant. Um, we're now live. So hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us on Opera in Conversation today. My name is Zelina Vulliami. I am the founder president of Oxford Contemporary Opera. And I'm really, really excited to be joined by Philip Venables today, who is a British composer of opera, music theatre, multimedia concert works, chamber music and song. And we'll be talking all about the works, all about the operas, everything and many pandemic based questions as well. But firstly, let me just introduce Philip. Thank you so much for joining us today. Hi, thanks very much for having me. It's brilliant to be able to talk to you in this this sort of Zoom format, isn't it? <laughs> thank goodness for Zoom. Yeah. Well, let me just start by, I, I guess, the most important question, which is, how are you? How are you finding the pandemic? How has it you know, impacted everything? Um, I'm finding it OK. I don't have very much to complain about, to be honest. Um, I'm, I have plenty of pieces to write, so um, I'm very busy doing that. Slightly crawling up the walls like everybody else, I imagine. But um, no, generally, it's, it's OK. That's that's really good to hear. Yeah, I guess with with composers, it must be obviously quite strange because you can't go anywhere. But I guess life hasn't changed that much. I mean, has it? Have you found that your composing style has been affected by you know just having to be in the same place all the time? No, not. I mean, I think the actual content of the work has not changed. Has not been affected at all. Um, I mean, obviously, some performances have been cancelled or, or postponed or, or gone on to online things or I haven't been able to travel to certain things. It's been a bit frustrating, of course, um, working with some performers over Zoom, which is really not ideal. And, and I look forward to being able to get, you know, get in a rehearsal room again. But in terms of writing, I mean, yeah, actually, as you say, it's like the same as it always was, basically. Yeah, it gives another meaning to the sort of composer in isolation, I guess. <laughs> so how, yeah, how have you found particularly, you know, rehearsals with singers and that kind of thing? Have you found that platforms like Zoom have actually helped or hindered or how have you found the general process of working with Zoom? Um, well, I haven't actually been working with any singers over um, during the pandemic. I have worked, I mean, I just did one piece with uh, an accordionist. Um, for example, and um, I mean, we we just we tried to work over Zoom, but it's not very successful. Um, so in the end, we had to kind of I had to make some material, send it to him. He would re prepare it, record it, and then we'd have a Zoom to discuss it. And then that would like happen iteratively um, every couple of weeks. So quite laborious. It definitely increased increased the workload. Um, but you know, I mean, it's I mean, it's great that we were able to do that without you know, remotely. So pre-pandemic, how did you find your artistic collaborations would happen, particularly when you're working with, you know, singers or performers or even directors? How how closely involved are you when one of your pieces is being performed? Um, well, um, I mean, usually quite closely involved. Um, I'm quite a hands-on kind of composer. Um, there will often be things in scores which are a bit vague <laughs> or that, you know, need some work with a performer to, to kind of realise properly. Um, of course, in terms of the operas that I've done, um, they have both been with Ted Huffman, who is my regular collaborator. So in that sense, getting into the rehearsal room is only the kind of end stage of a long process that's already happened, uh, a long collaboration that's already happened. So, um, you know, and obviously that's a, a very close collaboration from, from the inception of the piece to, to actually then getting it on its feet in a, in a room. But yeah, I mean, generally I'm very hands-on. Yeah, that's, I think that's really nice to hear. I mean, it's, it's, um, it's, it's so great to be able to speak to you today because you have written, you know, particularly these these two operas, 448 Psychosis and Dennis and Katia, which are, I think, really, really exciting uh, operas and deal with many sorts of themes. And, you know, we can go more into them later and we'll be hopefully viewing uh, YouTube clips of them just in a bit. But I just want to firstly touch on this thing that you've said about the director. So I know that, as you said, you've worked with the same director, Ted Hoffman, for both of them. How how do these collaborations happen? I mean, how, for example, with 448 Psychosis, how did that even come out of, you know, of, of whatever it was? Um, well, uh, 
that that came out of um, working with the Royal Opera House and looking for a subject matter to to make into an opera. And uh, I mean, originally I wanted to make a completely original piece and and work with a a writer on that. Um, but for various mainly logistical reasons um, that we didn't find a suitable partnership um, that kind of got off the ground um, in time for when I really needed to kind of, you know, get going on a, on a piece. Um, and, and then I kind of came back to the text of 448 psychosis and realized that actually in many ways that text offered a lot of the things that I was looking for in a new collaboration in an original piece. Um, So we kind of took a punt punt basically and and contacted um, the agent of of the Kane estate and and took it from there and then they gave permission luckily. Um, Yeah and that's how it's that's how it started. And of course, I think it's I think it's the only time um, an opera has been made out of Sarah Kane's works. And for for those of you who might not know, Sarah Kane was a, a sort of poet and theatre maker um, who who sadly died very young. But her work really is very powerful and deals with lots of themes, particularly surrounding mental health. How how do you think it? How did you find it adapting her words to opera? I mean, it's I, I think it's an incredible piece. I'd love to hear more about it. Um, well in some ways very easily because that text is so open and i mean it, it, in many ways it is basically a libretto a, as it stands although of course it isn't it's, it's a theater piece but there is there's so much flexibility in um already when you're making a theater piece out of it there's so much flexibility in who says what and um, how many people you have on stage uh etc cetera, etc cetera. so from um very kind of practical aspects it's it's very flexible to turn into opera um also the text is very tightly structured and very musical in many of its qualities there's passages of text which is very poetic and almost written in a kind of song form um there are a lot of references to music um in in it both um kind of explicit and implicit ones um and then there is a great variety of of kind of form and text register in it um, from that very, very poetic text to much more kind of abstract texts, um, which, again, are rendered very well in music. In fact, in, in many ways might be rendered more successfully in music than they can be in, in spoken theatre, possibly. Um, so it, it was it was a dream to work with that in a way. And, and I have to say, whenever I got stuck with composing whenever I kind of you know felt like I I had had a block I just went back to the text and um it was all there that there's so many ideas musical ideas in there brilliant I think we're now going to just for our audience just view a quick trailer of 448 psychosis so I'm just going to hand over to our technical team Uh, sorry, I think we're having a bit of a technical difficulty, as ever, with these old video calls. Um, I think we'll just try again. Smelling the crippling failure oozing from my smelling the crippling failure oozing from my my desperation clawing all consuming consuming panic drenching me as I gape in horror gape in horror at the world and wonder why everyone Oh, brilliant! I'm so glad we got to see that. So I think that even though it's a very very short clip, it kind of gives us a general overview into the sort of yeah what what the opera kind of is but um 
Can you tell me a bit more then about your composition process, particularly the music? I mean, do you have a process with the, you know, for writing opera? Do you have a sort of model that you follow or is it very much dependent on the text and the performance, that kind of thing? Um, it's very dependent on the text, of course. Um, the, I mean, I tend to work in quite kind of schematic ways. Um, and, and for example, with Ted as well, I think we work like that. Um, and with a lot of layers and a lot of references to other other things, be that style, other styles or specific um, other musics or, um, or genres, as it were. Um, it tends to be, um, I mean, I, I suppose we work very much from kind of building from the ground up. So um, we'll work very closely on text and music together, um, really establishing the form of each scene or of the piece as a whole, and then you know working in more detail on each scene, really um, kind of brainstorming and sketching form together so that when I sit down and compose, I have um, a very clear kind of scaffolding of what the form is and how the text is going to relate to the music um, what the dramaturgy of the scene is, um, and again, how that might be rendered in music. Um, so that's, I mean, that's broadly the process um, with original pieces like Denise and Katia, for example. With 448, obviously, um, that was me working on my own with the text um, for the most part. Um, and then it was very much doing a lot of, kind of deconstruction of the text and analysis if you like I mean I actually spent as many months working just on the text as I did actually writing music um, but that stood me in really good stead because um, yeah I would just spend a long time kind of storyboarding each scene and working out who's going to sing what and try and bring out some kind of characterization in each scene for example because of with that text all of that is up for grabs and you have to decide all of that yourself um, and, and yeah, and, and then, you know, kind of working on an identity, a musical identity for each scene. So for example, one scene is, is, is a real kind of like emo love song, um, which is kind of gradually like smeared across the canvas by, by the rest of the orchestra. Um, there's another religious kind of scene, like a foretelling of a, of a funeral possibly, um, which has a lot of um, religious references to it um, and um, it's, it's very spacious and yeah, I would be playing with like plain chant melodies or I mean fic fictitious plain chant melodies and those kinds of things. Um, some very angry scenes like the, the one in that trailer where I would yeah be working with kind of a tape cutting mashup kind of thing with spoken text. Um, so I suppose it's all like finding the, f the first character for each scene and then, you know, drilling down into that a bit more. And were you writing with particular performers in mind when you're writing 448 Psychosis? Um, yes and no, um, because we did the casting for that um, as I was partway through the composition. Um, but having said that, I mean, I mean, particularly one or two roles in that were of course, very much um, based on the on the vocal, I suppose the vocal characteristics of the singers that we cast. Um, but but yeah, but a lot of the material existed already. And you you sort of alluded earlier to this, I guess, back and forth process between performer and, and composer and obviously director. Did you find that the opera changed once it got into the rehearsal room? Um, yes, it did a lot. I mean, also in that score, there's so much open scoring in many ways, and it was a scramble to get it on its feet, I think, because there's so much ensemble singing in the piece. It was, it's a lot to learn um, for the six singers who, um, and it's quite limited as to how much one can prepare that on your own at home before starting in the rehearsal room. So, so there was a lot to do and there was, um, many open questions in the score um, and 
it, and it's a great credit to Ted Huffman and Richard Baker, who who were the director and the music director on that first production, um, who you know to to help shape that and and bring it to life. Um, obviously, all the video is being made alongside as well, and and I mean some things like, for example, that bit in the trailer required a lot of pre-recorded voice to be to be recorded with the cast during the rehearsal process so that scene was actually written entirely during the rehearsal process um, because of because we didn't have a recording session in advance so I mean there were lots of these kinds of things um, yeah but obviously then it became very fixed and that got written to the score um, and and then so the revival was was much more straightforward and would you say you were thinking about your audience when you were writing it? Because I think across these opera talks, I've, I've often asked this question, some directors or composers will say, no, no, I wasn't thinking about the audience at all. It's purely about the music and about the work. But some say, no, of course, you know, we're thinking about the audience and the impact that we wanted to have. So would you say that audience consideration is something that you have, you know, when you are writing music? Yeah, absolutely. But I mean, that can mean many things. Um... I think the worst thing you can do is to try and second guess the taste of your audience, but um, and, and to, to try and you know chase that dragon. But obviously, when I'm composing or working with Ted on you know imagining a kind of dramaturgy or or whatever, um, you're thinking of how of, of what it will feel like to be in that space and to, to have that performed in front of you and. Um, you know, yeah, what it will feel like to be immersed in, in that. So in a sense, if you, you're positioning yourself as the audience when you're writing, and I, I don't, for me, see any other way to do it. Um, it's definitely led by what experiences do I want to have and how do I want to feel if I were or when I am listening or sitting in this production. And I found particularly with 448 Psychosis, obviously, um, you know, it has this association of the Royal Opera House being quite a big cultural institution, you know, across the globe. But I found that it really worked well in terms of attracting younger listeners, younger viewers. Is that something that you sort of had in mind or something you expected from it when you were writing it? Um, it wasn't really something that I thought about while I was writing it, because, I mean, that's kind of irrelevant when you're, when you're, you know, working with the text and, and, and trying to make the piece um, because then I think it's really yeah about 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 the text and about the, about the content um, but obviously with um, getting permission to do the the Sarah Kane text um, I suppose we were we were aware and the Royal Opera House was aware that there would probably be more theatre audience coming because it's a very iconic piece of theatre um, it's a very common um, uh, item on A-level syllabuses for um, drama studies, I think. Um, so, you know, there were, there were some, um, some A-level groups in, in to see it and, and things like that. So, yeah, we, we, were, we were aware of it, but I don't think it came into the equation when I was writing. So you wouldn't say that the opera was sort of aimed at anyone in particular? Fair enough. Um, let's move on to your other opera that I would like to talk about in this discussion, uh, which I think I pronounced wrong earlier, sorry, but it's um, Denise and Katia. Can you can you give me a sort of overall um, impression of, of what this opera is about? Um, yes, it is, um, it is based on a true story, um, on a true event, which happened in November 2016 in the um, in very western part of Russia, in a town called just outside um, Pskov. And um, it was about these two teenagers who were 15 years old, um, a couple, um, and they were a, a very kind of classic Romeo and Juliet story, really. They were, um, because of family troubles, prohibited from seeing each other um, by parents, and or specifically by the parents of Katya. Um, and as a result, they ran away to um, a kind of summer house um, just outside of the city where they lived uh, and they hid there for three days and there were guns in the house it was kind of like a hunting cabin as well um, there were guns in the house and they were kind of fooling around with those they like 
shot a neighbor's dog and um, some, you know, things like that. Uh, and the police were called and the police ended up surrounding the house and um, then the special forces came because of the weapons and um, anyway, eventually after three days, the, the two children were dead. Um, it's unknown how they died as to whether they, I mean, the police say that they were, they committed suicide, um, but obviously nobody really knows that for sure. Um, and there was uh, a lot of kind of media spin off after this in Russia asking for an inquiry and, and this kind of thing because it was a tragedy and of course the kids should have been brought out alive. Um, what was really interesting about that is for a large portion of the time while they were hiding in this cabin, they were live streaming themselves on social media. So um, on a platform called Periscope. Um, so you have these very many layers of kind of narrative like they're, they're what was happening in the cabin, um, the people surrounding them in the in the town, the police and, and others kind of watching from the outside. Then all these people across the world on social media who, some of which was, of course, very dark, kind of trolling, essentially. Um, and then you have all this, like, worldwide media afterwards that reported on it. I mean, it also was, was covered by the BBC and the Daily Mail and, I mean, outlets all over the place. Um, so, but really, we ended up making a piece about, not. I mean, it was, of course, about these kids and that tragedy, but really about voyeurism and social media um, and how that, you know, changes our interactions, um, how that potentially changed the outcome of what happened. Um, yeah, this is kind of, you know, yeah, social media, live broadcasting phenomenon. Brilliant. I think we're just going to see a trailer of that now. Uh, fingers crossed we don't have the same technical difficulties as before. Special forces for the pen to release the weapons. If you watch after a while, they regret it all. She says the police said to them, throw out your weapons. Fantastic. I'm so glad we got to see a bit of that. So can you, for our audience, can you give us a bit more explanation about what is going on there? <laughs> yeah. Um, so we decided not to uh, have characters playing Denise and Katia themselves. So we have two performers and four cellists on stage. It was a very, very small scale opera. Um, and the two uh, performers, the two singers, 
play six different characters in um, a rapidly cutting kind of um, succession of interviews, if you like, um, some of which are based on real interviews, which we did with people surrounding the events, and some of which um, are kind of fictionalized from media accounts of the of the events. Um, so there's um, the best friend of Denise, there's a journalist who investigated the story afterwards, um, there's a neighbor, there's a local teenager, um, there's a medic on the scene, and I think that's everybody. Um, <laughs> uh, anyway, so, um, and yeah, basically we kind of modeled it on a talking heads documentary um, that you might have with a kind of crime reconstruction or something. Um, so the piece rapidly cuts uh, between all these different interviews, people giving their accounts of what happened. Um, uh, and so I think we have like 115 scenes in the space of half an hour in the first part of the piece. Um, and into that, we also put um, the kind of beeps with the projected text are text messages, WhatsApp messages between um, me and Ted about making the piece. Um, so it also kind of simultaneously tells the journey of the making of the opera um, from us or from Ted first finding the link on his Facebook news feed, um, I think from the Daily Mail about about what had happened to us then like discussing would, would this make a good opera? Is it voyeuristic? What are the problems? Um, how, you know, how we were working with the interview material, um, doing interviews with the journalist and the, and the best friend. Um, etc cetera, etc cetera. so that's so that's it. and in the end I mean that section you got there was quite kind of far on where it gets the cutting gets more and more um, tight um, as you work up to the moment at which they um, die um, so yeah so th at that point we've kind of established the form and we're very rapidly cutting between different characters Brilliant. I think it's, yeah, I, I personally think it's a really, really effective way of of sort of portraying the story while also adding that reflective aspect of the creative process. And as you say, this sort of voyeuristic um, element to it. I mean, you, you mentioned before that, you know, social media is such a large part of the story itself, but also the opera. How, I mean, how important do you think you know, I've, I've heard a lot of sort of operas which include social media these days. How important do you think social media is to opera in general, um, particularly through, I guess, storytelling? Um, well, I mean, I think obviously social media and the internet more generally is a large part of our lives now since, I guess, the last 20 years. Um, so if one wants to make opera that is about contemporary society, then it makes sense that some of that might um, kind of overlap with the internet or social media. Um, but that's not to say there's not plenty of interesting operas that could be made without that, of course. I mean, God, I hope that I'm not only ever making operas about the internet. Um, but um, yeah, and I mean, so it was important in this piece because of the content and because of what we wanted to talk about, the, the kind of wider issues of of the way we treat each other and, and human relations on on the internet and off the internet and how that affects these interactions. Um, and I suppose, um, what was I going to say? Oh, I can't remember. Um, but yeah, so in this piece, it was very important. Um, you know, but it won't be in every opera. Uh, yeah. So in terms of the content of the opera, I think it depends what story you want to tell, of course. Mm. So you wouldn't say you feel a sort of responsibility to tell more modern stories in opera? Um, well, yes. Uh, I personally think that that's more interesting. I wouldn't say necessarily important because there's lots of older stories that can tell us new things about ourselves. But um, but yeah, I mean, for my taste, I prefer to prefer I prefer to deal with things which are very relevant today, which um, are have something to do with my own life experience, of course. Um, um, you know, I'm not. I, yeah, I'm not going to critique 
what other people do in that sense. Um, but it's modern life is very interesting to me. And uh, obviously, Ted and I, for example, in the work we're doing, are drawing a lot on our own experiences and our own interests and our own, um, you know, pl sense of place in the world, let's say. Um, social media is definitely a large part of that. So, I mean, it was a topic that we wanted to to work on. Uh, but I would say, I mean, it wasn't that. The, we didn't want to make a piece about the internet because it's kind of new. But, um, but we were just more interested, I think, in the many, many layers in this story and the way that they all interact with each other so that you could build this very rich tapestry of storytelling through different characters and through these very many different layers um, in the piece, cutting very quickly between them all. Um, and we're both big fans of meta layers in, in work and, and works being aware of themselves and aware of their own creation and that not being some kind of pretense for the audience that we pretend, you know, doesn't exist. Um, and so like adding our own WhatsApp messages, for example, into this um, was something we felt very strongly about. It worked really well, the subject matter. Um, but I mean, in all the work we're making and, and also the work I make on my own, I'm often looking for like a meta layer of, of, you know, how you might be able to twist it on its head and, and have some kind of like more outside perspective. Yeah, really, really interesting stuff. I think, yeah, that aspect of sort of storytelling and the, the multi-layered parts of it are such an interesting thing to include in opera. I mean, I've seen, I think, in, in sort of interviews and, and across the internet <laughs> um, that you've referred, you've used words like music drama, music theatre and opera before. What does it mean to you to differentiate between them? Do you think, do you think we should use them interchangeably? Should they, are they different? You know, what, what do those words mean to you? Um, to me, they don't mean that much because um, I suppose mostly um, I'm building work in the opposite direction, right? I'm starting with subject matter and I'm thinking about what I want to do with it. And that might turn into what one would call an opera or music theater or, you know, let's say some kind of more installation piece or whatever. Um, but obviously it is true that I'm commissioned by various different organizations who have their own uh, definitions of what opera is or what music theatre is um, and the corresponding audiences who also have those definitions, let's say. Um, and that is something that I'm aware of, of course. I don't want to make a piece which is wholly unsuitable for the person who's, um, you know, for the audience who's going to see it or for the, for the house which is going to produce it. Um, I mean, I suppose broadly for me, it comes down to voice type um but i'm in all cases whatever the voice type i'm interested in making work which um is music led and has music very much at the like uh, the structural core of the piece but that's not to say there won't be um a lot of spoken text as well as singing and a lot of times of silence and like spoken theater maybe with no music or as there was in Denise and Katia for example um, all of those ingredients can be in it but I think um, the fundamental difference is that it the, the, the form has to really incorporate music and be essentially kind of music led rather than non-music theater i.e spoken theater let's say which if there is music and there might be music all the way through it, but it is not music led. Yeah, definitely. I, th I think it's a really, yeah, a, a really sort of curious matter in terms of how we define these different words and particularly through, you know, as you said yourself, through working with organizations and, and institutions. I mean, how do you view your role then as a composer working with organizations like, you know, big opera houses and, and directors? Do you find, you're quite limited and restricted or do you find that you've had actually experienced a lot of creative freedom? Oh yeah I mean I've, I'm very grateful to the people that I've worked with that I've always felt uh, f very free and I mean for example with the Opera House in 448 I was um, you know there was no nothing which I was told I couldn't do or I mean there was absolutely not I mean nothing like that they were incredibly encouraging and uh, I mean I think actually it, one of our very very early 
meetings, they said to me, um, always ask for what you want, whatever you want, ask for it. We might say no, we might say yes, but you should always ask. And that was, you know, that was a great basis for the relationship. And I think I'm the same with Philadelphia when we were making Denise and Katya. Um, I mean, we, in both of those cases, we were lucky that we had good workshop processes as well. Um, so there were no kind of like surprises really by the time we got to the end. I mean, well, I mean, the houses, the companies had heard the material. We had been working on it together, if you like, after each of those workshops, kind of evaluating and discussing and stuff. And I like I like the, the close, um, I like to work with producers who want to work closely with us. Um, it makes for a much more fun process and a much more successful relationship and I think also usually a better piece. Um, so yeah, no, it's always been very, very good, very open. Mm, it sounds like, yeah, you're, you're very involved in the, the creative production of, of these works. I mean, you've written so much music for the stage. Do you have any performing instincts yourself or do you purely just like to be sort of behind the scenes? Um, well, I mean, I definitely don't have any performing instincts for like playing an instrument um, uh, or singing for that matter. Um, I would probably like to do a bit more kind of music directing and conducting and like be a bit more. I mean, I am very hands on in the rehearsal room anyway and work very closely with conductors um, to. Yeah, you know, I, so I, I would like to probably do a bit more of that, but there's nothing on the table at the moment. Um, and the same with directors. I mean, and mostly that's been with Ted and we work very closely together. So I, you know, I, I just like, as long as the relationships are close, um, and I feel like I can get my hands dirty in other areas of the production and there aren't these kind of very like hierarchical or, or uh, very clear lines drawn between different people's responsibilities, then I'm happy to, you know, stick to composing if you like. Um, I did a couple of two or three years ago have a New Year's resolution for myself that I wanted to put myself in every single piece that I wrote uh, from that point onwards, which I think I've almost succeeded in. But most of that's actually really to do with, as I was saying earlier, like exploring these meta layers and making pieces which are also about themselves, if you like, that the, the, the artifice of the art is not ignored. And how, how have you found that that New Year's resolution mission? How, how have you sort of been able to insert yourself in the, I guess, in a sort of Hitchcock fashion into the, the music? <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, there was uh, obviously in Denise and Katya, there was uh, lots of, of material in there that was uh, our text messages. Um, I did a violin concerto, which was based on an old uh, tape recording of me learning the violin when I was 14 and about my teacher's teacher with whom I had a master class with at that stage um, which includes some of the audio footage so you can hear me playing a violin um, and and actually also has my recorded voice in um, yeah stuff like that really I mean it's not like a hard and fast rule obviously but I have to say going forward to the projects which um, which we're working on now, um, mostly do, we are looking for, it's always a question to ask myself at least anyway, can I be in this piece? <laughs> and do you think that will continue with the, you know, with the pandemic and everything and, and operas being produced in this, in this very strange circumstance? Yeah, I think so. Cause as I say that, I mean, to me, that's more about like the content and what, and what you're trying to do you know, in the, in the real bones of it more than, I mean, I don't think I'm going to be, you know, appearing on many stages. <laughs> so, um, it's, it's more about content that, you know, someone wants to offer. Who knows? Who, we, we might see the, the your debut anytime soon. <laughs> yeah, but I think my singing should probably just stick to the shower. The shower, as, as should mine. Um, I just, yeah, I'm aware that we're running out of time. So I just want to ask you a few questions. Just firstly, touching on the pandemic, which I mentioned just now. Um, I've noticed that a lot of operas are being produced digitally at the moment, particularly in concert seasons and everything. Is that something that you're you're interested in? Is it something that you're working for? I thought particularly, seeing as I know that you've worked with multimedia a lot, is digital something that you find exciting? 
Yeah, absolutely. Um, and it and you know I have had some discussions during during lockdown about about things which may or may not happen um, to do with I guess mainly making films. I mean I haven't ventured very much further than kind of film work, making films of pieces um, to something more techy like um, interactive work or virtual reality or um, you know these these kinds of things. Um, it's something I'm really, really open to. I suppose I think my my main kind of golden rule would be that it has to, that the content has to be made for that form. And I mean, of course, we uh, I have in the past discussed making films of the two operas which al already exist. But I think I mean, for example, with Denise and Katya, that would involve a little bit of you know changing of the material to make it really work in that medium which I'd be very happy to do um, but I, I don't I mean whilst I'm very grateful for streaming during the pandemic I'm a little bit fed up of all of these kind of empty concert hall pseudo performances where where everybody just kind of claps themselves afterwards and we pretend that there's an audience there when we know there isn't <laughs> yeah have you have you seen any any particular performances which have either jumped out at you as being really interesting or have perhaps yeah been quite disappointing in terms of the way that they've pr presented the works i'm certainly not going to say what i found disappointed <laughs> fair enough of course there have been things which have been you know disappointing um i think that the, whilst i understand that everybody's been struggling and houses particularly have been really scr struggling to just get something out um concert halls houses you know i'm talking more generally about classical music in general um I think, you know, moving in a longer term to digital platforms is a real opportunity and it would be great if we can kind of be very imaginative about how that, how that might manifest and, you know, that filming doesn't happen to have to happen in the same place as a, as a performance would, um, as we all know, it's obvious, but, you know, just to push push that uh, push the imagination a bit more and and probably in that case to get lots of people who haven't previously been involved in classical music like uh you know from theater or or um i guess probably more like filmmakers to actually work in these situations and and storyboard something that could be quite interesting so do you think then in in order to be a composer you know in 2021 i guess do you think then that you need to have those sorts of skills like technology, filming, that kind of thing? Or is it okay to sort of stick to the notes as it were? Oh, that's a tricky question because, I mean, I would probably say yes, I think it's very helpful, but of course it depends what work you're trying to make. And of course there's still plenty of space for people who, um, for artists who are making work, which isn't at all uh, using any technology. Um, I mean, I think these days for composers on a most basic level, you are typesetting your scores and, and working with computers, at least in the very, very minimal way of producing scores these days. Very few composers are, are delivering handwritten scores to performers. Um, so, you know, it's just a spectrum. Um, and I think everybody should, I mean, there's lots of tools out there and, and they can aid creativity. So it's really, people's own individual journeys as to how they explore that. Mm. That leads us actually very nicely onto our last section where we just turn to some questions from our audience. Um, the first of which is, I'm sure you've been asked this before, but do you have any advice for young and up and coming composers, particularly those who want to work in opera um, and works for the stage? Oh my goodness. Um, well, I mean, the same advice probably that has been heard elsewhere, but do as much as you can um you know uh apply for as many things as you can there are loads of uh kind of development schemes out there now especially for opera i think um the sector um is is really i feel like is really going through a golden age with with the way that it's looking at new work and fostering new work and the importance that, ha that has in opera so um there's lots of stuff out there and um, you know, do, do stuff with friends, try to get stuff on your feet yourselves. It's difficult, but it's, it's possible with very little money. And yeah, you just have to have to keep going. And I, I mean, 
I felt like I was doing a lot of that for many, many years before I got the big break with something that ended up being very successful, like 448. Um, so, you know, you kind of never know what's going to happen, you know, around the corner. I Yeah, I, w- I would add to that, actually. Do you have any advice for, I guess, young opera makers who are wanting to start out now, but perhaps see the, the you know, the, the scene in the industry in general as being quite daunting, especially in the face of the pandemic? Um, yeah, it is. And I mean, I, gosh, I don't, I, I really, my heart goes out to, to people who have just graduated from music college or who are, you know, just starting out on their journeys or whatever. I mean, it's a terrible time to be, to be trying to get, get your feet on the ground. But um, on the other hand, in terms of opera makers, I mean, we're in this very, um, finally in this very wonderful time where the sector is looking for new voices so actively so desperately looking for new voices and new material and new stories um so i hope that that's going to lead to many many opportunities and more uh, wider opportunities for for people um so you know i think there is still kind of hope and um potential there um, I'm very glad to hear you say that. Um, another question just says, uh, a lot of your works, particularly your operas, um, deal with very dark themes. What is it that draws you to these particular sort of dark themes, but also how important do you feel um, the role of sort of tragedy and humour is in your works? It's a very big question. <laughs> very good question. Um, well, there is obviously something very... Um, provocative not not provocative i mean moving or like um you know that stirs me inside as it were with this subject matter so it's something that on a kind of theatrical level and uh um emotional level i was i have responded to i suppose i tend to like that kind of d- darker stuff also in the in the literature that i read or the or the plays that i see or whatever other things um Having said that, the neck, you know, it's not all all tragedy. I mean, the next piece I'm working on is definitely more light-hearted and is um, is is much more joyous than the last two operas. Um, but I, I, I mean, I think my style of writing is 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 quite dramatic um, and. Um, kind of a bit bombastic and you know uses like let's say bright colors and and things like that it's not very subtle it's maybe you could say even a little bit trashy so in a sense that works well with um you know very extreme subject matters i think um yeah but it's only two operas so you know who knows what that you know what what is coming next and i might never make a tragic opera again Mm. Well, can you can you give us a hint at uh, what you might be working on next? <laughs> uh, no, not really. But it's very joyous and um, lots of song and dance and and happiness. And um, it's going to be uh, yeah, it should it should really make the audience kind of smile and also be you know provocative and make them think as well. Sounds perfect for a a post-pandemic opera. Um, We just have a couple more questions and I'm just aware of time. Uh, So firstly, I'll just ask, uh, how well do you think the opera industry in general has responded to the pandemic? We sort of discussed this already, but just a a brief. Yeah, mixed with some people really well, some others not so. Um, Yeah, that's it's hard. I mean, I think everybody's been struggling because partly because they've had so little ability to plan and I know that houses have kind of planned seasons 10 times over only to you know have everything pulled out from underneath them two weeks later so um, I think people have done a really good job in the circumstances and I think this will just be our last question Uh, it's kind of a two-parter the first part is do you have a favorite opera Um, and the second one is what music are you listening to at the moment so why why don't we start with the first one which is I know it's very hard but um well i don't have one favorite but i have probably a top five and again it's these really bombastic things like so like lady macbeth or or check or electra 
Um, I had a guilty pleasure for Madame Butterfly. Um, yeah, stuff like that. Um, and the second question was, what am I listening to right now? Well, um, well, this week, uh, one evening, I listened to Simon Bainbridge because he very sadly passed away um, a few days ago. And so I kind of raised a glass to him and, and listened to his music one evening because he was um, he was running the academy department when I was there. Um, and then uh, last night, I think I was listening to a new album by Leo Chadburn um, that has five pieces of uh, spoken text pieces um, by him I think is really interesting and um, and that's just come out so giving that a plug excellent well that is all we've got time for but Philip Venables thank you so much for joining us and for answering so eloquently and interestingly on all of the questions that we've had thank you very much for having me um, I've been Zelina Bulliami and this is Opera in Conversation. If you want to view more of our events, they're all on our website and our YouTube channel. We've got some really, really exciting guests coming up. So just keep, keep following us, keep seeing what we're doing. And in the meantime, I hope that everyone is staying safe and well.